Well, internet audience, um, you may still be filing in to the Zoom room, uh, but it became so quiet in this room that I feel I have to begin. Mm -hmm. A blessed silence descended on the room. So um, it is a great pleasure to begin the second part of, of our evening. And I wanna say that um, three years ago, my colleague Bojena Shalcross and I uh, decided to organize this conference and we commissioned Cynthia Haven to write a book <laughs> called um, A California Life, Chesel Milosh, A California Life. And we arranged things so that the conference would take place just one week after the book <laughs> appeared. Um, it somehow felt that way. It's actually not the case at all. So the book is the product of a National Endowment of Humanities grant. Uh, it was started in 2018. It's the third book about Milos that uh, Cynthia Haven has written. She has also written about Rene Girard and she just um, handed me this book that also came out this year. So she's been very busy. She said that COVID has been a very productive time for her. Uh, this is the man who brought Brodsky into English conversations with George L. Klein. Uh, she was just telling me that she studied with Brodsky and he made a, a deep impression on her. Um, and I almost feel when, when I read this uh, book about Milos that in a way she studied with Milos uh, as well in a different sort of way, but uh, not only with Milos, but many of his translators and, and people who knew him well. Uh, Really, it is a, a wonderful book, and it, if if in preparing for the conference, you know, I, I just it was perfect reading, and it brought together some themes that we're going to be discussing tomorrow. So it's just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for us to hear her. Uh, she's going to talk a bit about the writing of the book, and then read a couple of sections from it and then she and I will begin a discussion that we will then open up to the audience in the room and online. And with, without further ado, oh, with one, actually with a little bit further ado, uh, Esther is going to post a message in the chat for those online. We are happy to offer uh, copies of the book to people who are interested. So uh, she will tell you how to do that through the chat. And for those in the room, we have a, a sign-up sheet over uh, on the table. You can put your email down there and we will arrange for a copy of the book to be sent to you, um, which will be a wonderful addition to your libraries. So now, without further ado, uh, Cynthia, please join us. How to begin about this California this right? Can you hear me? Thank you. How to begin about this California, Miwosh wrote to a friend in 1961. Something like the Riviera, but on the wild side. Despite the view I have from my window of five neon cities, about as close to us as Paris from the suburbs. The wildness depends on something else, he continued, on the eucalyptus, on the mountains as if they were on the moon on the desert, on the restless ocean, furiously smashing the cliffs and emptiness, in a word grandeur, or on the foul chemicals above the nearby industrial cities, rattlesnakes and barking seals. That's from a letter he wrote to the influential post-war literary critic Jan Blonsky, a year after the poet's arrival in the Berkeley Hills. It shows his sense of wonder, horror, and many other conflicting reactions at once which pretty much sums up his take on the Golden State. Today, uh, by Zoom and by attendance, I'm among the Miwoshians, or as NAC publisher Georgie Il would say, on the continent Miwosh. It is good to be together and it's good to well see, virtually or in reality, so many of you. I'm humbled to be speaking among so many of his friends and colleagues, people who know him much better than I did, and certainly for much longer. I was the last journalist to interview him in California before he went back to Poland forever. 
I thought it would be the beginning of a connection and instead it turned out to be the ending of one. What did he think of California? Let me read from my introduction. In the late 1970s, Mark Kloos was raking leaves and twigs at Czesław Miłosz's Berkeley home on Grizzly Peak. The former student of, me, of the Polish poet remembers him laughing, then explaining, if California is not a separate planet, it is at least a separate colony of the planet Earth. What did he mean? California was not wholly the work because of, of the earth because it was like a prehistoric landscape where human activity and civilization had no place and were completely dwarfed, Clouse told me. There's an air of detachment in California throughout the rest, really. For this reason, I say California was a desert for Miłosz. He eventually de developed a deep ambivalence towards the place. Although what wasn't Miłosz ambivalent about? Miłosz had expressed the same thought in a dis discussion of California in his visions from San Francisco Bay. He said, our species is now on a mad adventure. We are flung into a world which appears to be a nothing or at best a chaos of disjointed masses we must arrange in some order. That is from the English translation but in the original Polish version, the phrase mad adventure is literally lunar adventure, which conveys not only the sense of lunacy, but also explains Miłosz's sense of California's role as a colony, a place colonized by the rest of the earth, hence its contradictions. Miłosz was an oceanic thinker as well as writer, and he spent four decades of his life, the bulk of his literary career here. He was an American citizen, an American writer, and an eminent professor at the University of California, Berkeley. To this day, he is still its only Nobel winner in the humanities. Yet his beginnings were far away, starting with his 1911 birth on his family's Lithuanian manor among the Polish speaking gentry. His literary career took him to Warsaw and after its destruction to a diplomatic post in the United States, where he served the Stalinist government of Poland. He defected in Paris, and then nearly a decade later, was invited to teach in California. With the birth of a free Poland, he repatriated and died in Krakow in 2004. He had a hybrid identity despite himself. The irony is that the greatest California poet, and certainly one of America's greatest poets too, could well be a Pole who wrote a single poem in English to Raja Rao. In California, springtime flowers linger to December, whether in the wild or perfected gardens. We become accustomed to the fragrance of star jasmine in the air and the annual explosion of blossoms. Magnolia trees, bougainvillea, sunflowers and lilies, orchids and roses. All this against a backdrop of cam camphorous, camphoraceous, eucalyptus trees with their swaying branches of green grain leaves. Hills of invasive orange California poppies stay with us through September. Then the dry months, the green hills turn yellow by late spring and rain ceases, sometimes too early and too completely. Drought and aridity under the hot sun is an aspect of California life too. But most of us adjust, did he? He wrote in the separate notebooks, I did not choose California. It was given to me. What can the wet north say to this scorched emptiness? Some will think that the figure of speech, the comparison to the moon is a bit overdrawn and over the top, but Miwosh wasn't the only person to describe California that way. I remember soon after I moved to California from London, I was visited by a colleague from British Vogue, Anna Harrington. And as dust descended on the fabled streets of San Francisco, she looked at me and asked, how can you stay here? It's like living on the moon. Whatever its troubled future with earthquakes and wildfires, it has a mythic status in the nation and indeed world. We inhabit a myth, perhaps the moon. Some question the premise of this book, Miwosh an American? I had no idea my contention that Miłosz was an American poet as well as a European one would be so controversial. 
it seems self-evident to me that if you live in a place for 40 years, as he did, and become a citizen of that nation, it would inevitably become a part of you. It has for me, and I've also spent 40 years in California, and it certainly changed me in ways I couldn't always foresee, and it certainly changed him too. What's more, and this is purely anecdotal, I'm told that in Poland, many, when he returned uh, in 2004, uh, not 2004, he returned in 2000, or even in the 80s, his earlier period of coming back and forth, that many considered him an American poet. Mm -hmm. While here, he is considered indubitably a Polish poet. And, you know, well, that's the nature of adaptation. It depends on the backdrop. Andrei Fernacek's marvelous 2017 biography of the poet uh, is a masterpiece and yet somewhat short on America other than as a biographical fact. One phrase he wrote stuck on, to me, quote, it is necessary to slow the pace and expand or dilute this story to present somehow the taste of this California monotony. Monotony, Berkeley in the 60s. <laughs> And yet, I know what he means. As Orson Welles is said to have said about California, you sit down at 25 and stand up at 62. The poet's son and executor, Tony Miłosz, expressed some relief and pleasure that I was writing this book. He noted that too often the attitude in Poland was that Miłosz had to leave post-war Stalinist Poland. He came to America. He sat and brooded here for 40 years. And then he went back to them. I hope this book colors in some of the picture, clarifying his role in the country where he did so much and wrote so much. The bulk of his poetic career was in America. He wrote an astonishing body of work and struggled to comprehend our people, our land, our lives. And he was less alone than he thought. This book is an explanation. I think it'll be the first of many of how that grafting occurred, where it took, and where it didn't. His poems reveal the process. So, readings. I've got two readings for you. Um, uh, they focus on two of his friends. Um, uh, you won't be able to follow because I'm scared. I've, I've, edited and cut cut and paste a bit um, for to give a sense of a, an arc. This is uh, begins on page 83. It is a mild January day, even on California terms, and not an ideal setting to talk about poetry. Yet here we are on a sunny afternoon at Pete's coffee shop in Berkeley. Robert Haas in jeans and a sweater and a well-worn shoes carries a black canvas briefcase full of books and papers and manuscripts. He's a few minutes late, but eventually we settle under an orange cafe umbrella to discuss Miwosh's poems as we observe busy locals enter and leave the small row of shops on 4th Street. The setting and its convergences and divergences brings to mind one of Miwosh's early popes in America. From it was winter. This is not a place where you sit under a cafe awning on a marble piazza watching the crowd. There is no marble piazza, however, just black metal chairs and tables on the concrete patio. The former U.S. Poet, poet Laureate and Pulitzer Prize winning poet is as serene and unruffled as he had been when I interviewed him two decades ago at his home in Marin's rugged Inverness. I've known Bob Haas now for close to 20 years. I saw him in UC Berkeley's wood panel Morrison libraries at what turned out to be Miwosh's last reading in Berkeley, although no one knew that at the time. He has translated more of Miwosh's poems into English than anyone else, translations that were so successful that the first collected, published in 1988 by Echo, sold briskly even at $30 a pop. Said Miwosh, I had never believed it would be possible to have contact through translation, never, yet it happened. In the years since I've watched Haas move from his mid to late fifties to his mid to late seventies. 
It's one of the gifts time offers. If we're lucky, he has mellowed into his own wisdom and Miwosh is part of it. A poet observed recently that you can't talk for more than half an hour with Bob Haas without the conversation turning to Miwosh, even 16 years after the poet's death. Poet met Poas, poet circa 1978, a decade before Haas would join the faculty at Berkeley. A meeting was inevitable. The two were already Berkeley neighbors and shared a publisher, Daniel Halpern at Echo, who was publishing a vol volume of Miwosh's poems. So perhaps it was only a matter of time before their paths crossed. Moreover, Haas had been impressed by Miwosh's work since he had read The Captive Mind in 1960. He remembers introducing himself to the poet three decades his senior at an international poetry festival in San Francisco. This is from Bob. He had a fierce, hawkish, standoffish formality. In those days, when he gave public readings, which was rare, he would read in Polish and have someone else read the English. I thought at the time it was because he was concerned about his accent. I came to understand, Haas trailed off, Basically, his English is perfectly good. He has a strong accent, but he's not hard to understand. It was his way of insisting on his Polishness, his way of being true to himself. Quite unnecessary, really. Haas was clearly an important in his own right by then, but his offer to help translate for Miłosz was a decision that would change his life. And this is a quote from him. So by accident, in the course of this, at an age when I was really too old to have a master anymore, I got to apprentice myself to this amazing body of poetry. At the cafe, Haas pauses again in the collected at one of the first poems Miwosh wrote in Berkeley. Far West, dated 1962, describes the American West but through the language of the 17th century Baroque verse and the shepherd poems of Horace. Its motif, the repeated line, gently my lambs, move gently, is taken from the Polish Baroque poet Jan Gawinski and was influenced perhaps by the English poet Andrew Marvel. What haunts is the penultimate negation. Nothing witnesses here. That would become a theme and subtext and subtext in Magic Mountain and throughout our lands and so many other poems. In this new and unfamiliar terrain, the poet was trying to locate himself in the prism of his poems. He status, quote, he stayed at it, struggling to find a place to stand in this new world. The intellectual turmoil of Paris, Gilson, and the medieval world was wholly irrelevant, he has says. Could it be captured at all? It was capturing the wrong way to think about it. Miwosh was already a great poet in the 1940s, but something shifted internally from the mid 60s onward. I think that's connected to exile. The basic condition of exile is to have lost the paradise, Haas explained. In order to be a prophet, he had to get an intellectual hold on where he is and what's happening. At some point he lets go. He takes possession of the California landscape, or rather it takes possession of him and he achieves a brilliance of a different magnitude altogether. He forms a hybrid identity, neither Polish nor American, but both at once. By the end of the decade, he can write a poem in which the elderly sisters of his Vilnius, Vilnius youth, Anna and Dora Drugino, call to him, although he is visiting Arizona, quote, because except for me, no one knows if they ever lived. The spinster sisters, two gently born parakeets from Samogisha, live again as they join him in the Sonoran Desert among the saguaro cactus and Joshua trees. His increasingly unified vision embraces the double perspective of there and here, then and now, and the complexity of the entire 20th century experience. He no longer chooses between a lost and inaccessible Europe or the alien paradoxical California. They are a double mirror, reflecting and amplifying one another in an infinite regression of meaning. Quote, and I was running as the silks rustled through room after room without stopping. 
for I believed in the existence of a last door. In the California of Magic Mountain, grandiose prophecy had seemed irrelevant before the endless waves of the Pacific that never answer back. He had resisted the po poetic tradition of the Vatic poet. In America, after all, what, it, what did it mean to water the ashes of a dead in a country that defied death with its ubiquitous youth culture, its consumerism, its television commercials and plastic surgery, the desolating emptiness of its desert stretching to the horizon? What did a stance of resistance mean? A resistance to what? Now Haas is silent turning the pages and rereading the poem, an intense and loving homage to the man that had been more, much more than a friend or mentor. I don't know how many, how many of you have been to his birthday house by chance? I love that place. <laughs> it's, um, well, this is about Grizzly Peak. Um, his house is now owned by the journalist Mark Danner, who was a friend of his. And I, I fell in love with that place. Um, Grizzly Peak was not his first address in the United States, but it was the one that would become forever linked with his name. The Grizzly Peak address has more name recognition in Poland than the United States. Miłosz's cottage, looking like an illustration for Brothers Grimm story, is a landmark for Polish literary pub pilgrims. But among Californians, the summit is known mostly for its hiking trails, its spectacular panoramas, and its flora and fauna. And that is the point. This was nature for him. It was a place seemingly impervious to history, a place of eternal return the setting for every day he spent in Berkeley. It provided the respite, the tranquility, the place to, comp to contemplate being. Yes. Whatever he saw elsewhere in California, in Death Valley or the gold country, in the deserts or canyons, this was the place that offered a permanent surround. This was his Patmos. The last eponymous bear is long gone from Grizzly Peak, and the land has been reclaimed by the deer that possessed the area way before the humans arrived. Now they multiply without predators. Only humans shoo them away, as Miwosh did when he wasn't enchanted by them. But he was often enchanted. In one poem written near the end of his life, he recalls a moment of wonder. A doe with two young just born has chosen to stay on the lawn outside my window. In the poem describing the birth, he answers a pessimistic philosopher of despair with his own astonishment at nature. The irises are blooming again and the ocean in the morning is veiled with mist. I tried to find the bush, I did, tried to find the bush where this incident he describes took place. But Mark Danner laughs, explaining that the deer are everywhere on Gri Grizzly Peak, and it could have happened anywhere. The deer nibbled relentlessly at Miwosh's trope, but not only that, they moved on to the pansies and the rose and the spirea. They chewed away at the leaves of a newly planted apple tree, which Miwosh had put into the ground with optimism, but quickly yielded to despair. Now Danner, the current owner, says they come to the win window to observe him as he works, watching him move through the house, their heads simultaneously moving from left to right and back again as if following a tennis game. For Danner, these elegant and annoying creatures are forever linked with Miwosh's death. On the morning of August 14, 2004, Danner went downstairs for coffee and he saw an unprecedented sight in the backyard. He counted 13 deer. Quote, I had never seen anything like this. And I thought, my God, is there a confab, a papal conclave or something like that? What is this? In one of the back rooms, the phone began to ring and he heard the voice of Bob Haas. Mark, Mark, pick up, pick up. I don't want to leave this on the machine. I just had a call from Krakow and Cheswell has died. 
but death wasn't unexpected. Miwosh had been ill for over a month and was, after all, 93 years old. Danner looked at the convocation of deers that had silently gathered to say farewell to the man who had both opposed and sheltered them. A wave of sadness came over him and he thought, how can I ever get anyone to believe this story that they have gathered here in some way? Then Danner shows me his copy of the collective, which bears Miwosh's dedication dated March 25th, 2002, quote, in the name of all the generations of deer inhabiting Grizzly Peak. <laughs> I think I need some water too. So we're going to reorganize a little bit here. And I'm just going to wait for the signal that we're, that, that process is complete. So, um, yeah, I'll take my mask off. <laughs> oh, my mic fell off. Sound good? Yeah, okay. So uh, this book was interesting uh, for me for many reasons, but uh, you know, another reason is that uh, I trailed through Berkeley uh, toward the end of Miloš's time teaching in the Slavic department there. I never took a class with him. I, I had friends. Um, I, I think uh, my, my friend um, Molly Westling, who was a grad student um, the year before, she was his research assistant. I think she's joined us. You might hear a question from her later. Um, I was no more than a, uh, a face in the crowd for the most part, although I do remember passing him in the hall one time and him smiling rather benevolently benevolently at me and you know um that he was that kind of presence where that was memorable you know <laughs> um i did hear him give a reading and i, I uh remember that um bob haas came to the reading and and Milos stopped is uh, uh sorry bob if you're listening but he came in a few minutes a couple of minutes late and Milos had already begun to speak but he stopped and said ah Robert Haas, the poet laureate mm -hmm. of the United States. He was very pleased, I think, um, that Bob Haas, obviously, he, he would have been pleased that, that he was translating him. And we are uh, very fortunate to be able to um, speak with, with Robert Haas tomorrow. So um, back to the book. Um, as I said, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and it just brought back many memories. Even just when you were speaking, you mentioned um, you know, the only Nobel Prize winner in, in the humanities at Berkeley. And there were a number in other fields. And I, I always remember. Um, Everyone does. <laughs> when, when I went to get a haircut at the, at the uh, barbershop across, um, um, across Bancroft Avenue from the campus, uh, the woman was cutting my hair and she told me that she had cut the hair of eight Nobel Prize winners. Uh -huh. And I wonder if Milos was one of them. I have to say, I do uh, remember that when I got home, uh, it was not a very good haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I think she was so caught up in telling me these stories. But I thought you were going to mention the famous Nobel parking spot for him. That oh, requested. no, I wasn't going to mention that. That's another story. But um, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so in your book on, on page 165, for anyone following at home, I think that's the page number um, you make a reference to uh, you who wronged and say uh, that it could be written because he was in Washington. So that, that distance allowed him a kind of freedom to express certain things and to develop certain ideas uh, on paper and publish them. 
And then earlier in the book, uh, you talk about his anxiety and, and paranoia and how that followed him out of Poland, even to, to the West, to Washington. You know, he was seen as a, someone who didn't fit in Poland and someone who didn't necessarily fit in the United States in certain circles. And um, you write that it relented when he went to Berkeley. So I just want to think about the, the, the space you, in the reading, you emphasized the, the kind of lunar landscape in this sense of alienation. And, you know, it's a, it's a theme, a kind of loneliness, but it was also a kind of refuge. And it was a, you know, it was a kind of exile, but maybe a, a remarkable exile. I suppose exile in Siberia may share some of those features. That's also an amazing landscape for exile. But I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about um, the, the tension between these two and, and how as you worked through the book, um, you know, you have scenes where he uh, is encountering the, the kind of the beatnik, the peace, peacenik movement. And uh, there's a scene that you, you give where he reacts with some stern kind of parental uh, <laughs> Theater. Theater, <laughs> Theater. Right. yeah, it's a, it's a good way to put it. Yet, you know, you also give, a, I think, a really, really successful, really interesting account of how complex his attitude toward the, the youth movement and toward Allen Ginsberg and um, Robertson, Ro and Jeffers, you know, the, the, there are these figures that represent a kind of counterculture. And I, I saw where he said, he was asked about, you know, why he wrote this poem for Allen Ginsberg, and, um, you know, he said something to the effect, well, you know, we were very different, obviously. I, I'm, I'm a square. Um, but there, you know, I, I, I think, I guess I'm, I'm maybe, I've talked so long that I've begun to ask a second question. So <laughs> maybe let me backtrack, and let's just talk about um, the way you feel that Berkeley fits, particularly Berkeley. It's not just California, it's Berkeley. And Berkeley is really the epicenter of that, you know, that free speech movement and all those other things going on in the 1960s. Go. Well, he's, he was so much his own in his own world up there. I mean, it's uh, Grizzly Peak is this remote and beautiful place with the light hitting the bay. It's um, It's so far, he referred to an unheard of tongue, speaking an unheard of tongue in Magic Mountain. But the reason it's not an unheard of tongue anymore is because of him. The first thing he began doing when he got to Berkeley was putting together books like History of Polish Literature. Was it, I think it was Richard Lurie, someone said the only textbook that can be read for fun. Um, and post-war Polish poetry. I, he was translating the poetry of Alexander Vought. He, he, he was the, Peter Dale Scott, and he were the first translators of Zbigniew Herbert. His relentless and tireless efforts to advance Polish literature, culture, and poetry. I mean, that pretty much, I think, I, the, the, the output is just astonishing. And there was nobody to translate his work really here. So he trained them. <laughs> he created a generation of translators to translate all these poems. And it's a, it's a remarkable record. So I think the noise of Berkeley was pretty much in the background for him because that wasn't his focus. I mean, it's just, uh, even when he had a dry period, he would do something like an invent a new form, like the roadside dog, and or, or I guess ABCs is a Polish genre. But he would just he would turn to something else. Uh, Tony Miłosz told me about how he would wake up in the middle of the night and and begin reading more, learning more. The industry of the man was phenomenal, so I I think he could be excused for seeing seeing a certain amount of self indulgence. <laughs> in Berkeley, and I, I think that that's fair. At the same time, he was against the war in Vietnam, um, but he saw it with a different perspective, too. You know, he never forgot the burning city. He never forgot Warsaw. 
he never forgot that he came from what he called the other Europe. Um, I think the incident that you're referring to was when he was met by a bunch of protesters uh, as he was walking to class and uh, raising and shaking his cane, he said in his best Slav accent, be gone, spoiled children of the bourgeoisie. <laughs> and the crowd parted and he went, <laughs> he went his way. Um, he was always aware that the students that he had left behind no longer had any rights to protest. Um, what was it he said about the students in Berkeley? They complain because they have too much. They rage because they have too much. Um, Berkeley still does not look favorably upon that comment, and yet there is a truth to it. He could take so many perspectives, and I think even today in America, we just see everything is, is it left wing or right wing? There's this linear perspective, and that's two dimensional, and he was four dimensional. And so it seemed like a sort of simplistic way of looking at the world when he could see so many points of view at once. Yeah. You uh, note that elsewhere, he, in a more sympathetic vein, I guess, noted that what the students crave is warmth, a commodity lacking in this society. Well, I want, I'm going to turn, I'm, I'm going to keep my comments relatively short because I want to allow the audience to um, engage as well. But I want to turn to the question of uh, nature and this other impact that you also addressed in your opening, your introduction. Um, a passage from page 66, I've noticed that California nature has permeated me and already appears in my poems. Yes blended with that surrounded with what surrounded me in my childhood, something akin to what Bob Haas said. Um, and I think that's a, maybe a nice uh, follow up to what you were just saying about how, this blending of sort of the Eastern uh, European perspective with that that he found yes. at this farthest, you know, this most Western point, I guess. Um, two elderly sisters wandering in the Sonoran Desert. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's really eerie. I mean, that's Yes. And uh, I just had a couple of other things that I pulled out from your text. You know, the idea that um, nature plays a, a special role here, the American psyche being dominated, this is your formulation, by nature because it lacks a sense of historical past. Um, and then, well, I have a follow up on that. Maybe I'll just let you start with that and then I'll ask a follow up. Um. Well, that, I think that was his point of view, although I may have expressed it. Um, <laughs> there's a story in the book with Richard Lurie, who was in his first class. He trained him to be a translator. He was in first class in Berkeley in 1960 and collecting the blue books from the students and reading them. He comes back next week and says, I want to read one paper it shows a typical American lack of historical consciousness. And Richard Lurie burned with shame because <laughs> it was his paper, although it wasn't named. And he said, I'm going to get one of those. I'm going to get one of those if it kills me. I'm going to have a historical consciousness. And then he adds something to the effect of, little did I know that this was something that Miwosh was trying to escape from. And to Lillian Valley, he described historical consciousness as half history and half evil. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite quotes ever from Miwo, she said, one of the benefits of coming from Eastern Europe during this terrible time is we can acquire a nation, notion of good and evil, not as something that was philosophical, but had, you know, was like as real and concrete as the taste of bread. And there are those passages where you, you, you talk about the, the trees in California being like the, you know, the- Like and not like. Like, like a cathedral, right? Yes. How, could, how could they have created Gothic cathedrals without having seen these? Yes. But, but something sort of, it, that, that tension, I guess it's the four dimensional element that you were talking about, that he yeah. um, had this anxiety about that historical uh, sensibility, but also, 
um, an awareness that that anyone who lacked it um, can see things. You know, yes. In, in, one of the things that, this is an aside to that, one of the things that bothered him in America was seeing things that were like Poland, but not like. So this, this jarring like and not like, you know, you, I think it was oaks. He said, you know, in, in Poland, you have an oak, but like in America, you have 17 kinds of oak and none of them are quite like the ones in Poland. So that there was this constant sense of seeing things that are a little bit off relative to what he was used to. Well, that's a perfect, um, perfect segue to my follow-up thing. <laughs> okay. um, there's a section in the book, and this is, this is a moment where I feel your voice really coming in, um, where you talk about the root system of the golden aspen and how complex it is that it can govern hundreds or thousands, you say even hundreds of thousands of trees that are all genetically identical. Um, there's a way in which that seems very much that that interest uh, is very much a product of the moment. Um, we're hearing uh, about the you know the, the we're learning much more about the marvels of of mushrooms and the way that trees communicate and just the complexity. And I think there's a kind of attentiveness um, to the natural world that is born out of uh, a growing sense that we might have really spoiled it. Um, in, in a more profound way than, than we ever understood, even though we had plenty of signs of that. And one of the things that I, I feel sometimes when I read Milos, there are passages where you, you feel that he's almost writing about this moment now. And yeah. This moment when this kind of thinking is becoming more widespread. And, you know, as I said, Bojena and I even talked about biopoetics as a possible, you know, title, subtitle for the conference. And um, I just wondered if you could expand on that, that, you know, you, it, it does feel like your voice from the here and now, but, you know, how you saw that fitting in with Milos's perspective on nature, the way he connected to nature. It was important to remember, too, that he considered his first calling, not poetry, but as a naturalist. And when he came to America, it took, he read James Fenimore Cooper as a boy and Deerslayer and Last of the Mohicans. And that was his idea of America. No matter what movies he saw, no matter what he knew, somehow that image of James Fenimore Cooper <laughs> overrode what he knew was there. Um, and it always did, but he was also concerned about uh, pollution of the mind as he did in that talk in Santa Fe. And he talks about that in the Allen Ginsberg poem too, too, about you know, the TV. Uh, it's an interesting poem because he says it's not him, he's creating a persona and yet he complains about many of the same things in, in his other work. Um, so yes, I think he, he did foresee pollution, not only in the environmental crisis, but also um, it's parallel in the human psyche and the uh, confusion of the mind. A consumerist society, I mean, uh, in Frenacek's books, he has some beautiful images of the kind of advertising that was available <laughs> at the time Mimos came here. Cigarette ads with, you know, billboards with real smoke coming out of the, uh... <laughs> so, um, that was his first reaction when he came to America was his outrage at the pristineness of America, not only its consumerism, but he was coming from a city that had been burned out and to see everything so pure and whole and untouched and virginal. Kind of virginal culture and virginal landscape. A virginal yeah. landscape, but also just nothing had been touched by the war. Nothing had been, I mean, you can say Pearl Harbor, but that was on the other side of the continent. And it was profoundly disturbing for him. Okay, I think this, that is a, a good point to turn to the audience and invite audience questions and also from the Zoom audience. 
did you remark at all on our shopping centers and streets that made highways that go forever with store after store after store? <laughs> so, another part of the landscape. So the question was uh, just for the Zoom audience, did he remark at all on uh, the shopping centers and, and, and such go on and on and on? Well, I don't um, remember him yeah, saying, it, saying about the shopping centers per se, but he had a lot to say about American consumerism and everything oriented towards purchasing, buying, using. And gosh, hasn't that gotten worse over the years? That was even before Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Is it rustling? Okay, I'll try to be still. I have a, I have a Zoom question. So uh, Molly Wesley asks, uh, hello, and congrats on this book, which I am enjoying immensely. One of my tasks as New York City's assistant from about 1990 to 1995 was to organize a fan mail, which was later boxed up and sent to his archive at Yale. It was so much fun to read that mail and occasionally take dic dictation when he responded to his fans. My question is, have you ever visited his archive at Yale? And did you find anything interesting there? For example, his fellow poet, Isla Shimborska, used to send him postcards she made, odd collages with uh, cryptic messages. Uh, did you encounter that collection? Uh, I didn't encounter that collection. I, it, it was several years ago. I don't remember. I do remember reading a couple of postcards from Allen Ginsberg. <laughs> but there wasn't, you know, postcards. There's nothing of nothing. No, I did. I did go through the. You know, it's a huge archive. I didn't see everything. But yes, I, I cite a lot of material from from the uh, archives. Oh, Jenna. Yeah. At this point, um, two questions. Uh, just to, to, to follow the uh, track of this conversation, the Beinecke uh, Library at Yale uh, has been now reorganized and it's you know, an easier uh, material to study. Um, when I first went there in the 1990s, it was um, still in pretty, pretty uncharted territory. Uh, and uh, I, um, I remember that the only thing I really copied from, uh, from this collection were poems, were his poems with doodles. Miłosz was a very avid draftsman, if we may call his doodles um, drawings. And uh, Donner, says that when he would visit um, uh, Miłosz's house in uh, um, Berkeley, uh, the doodles covered everything. Every piece of paper, every note, every book uh, was covered with doodles. And I just wanted to ask you, because I am writing actually about this particular um, aspect of his creation, I wanted to ask you whether you have seen that proliferation of doodles when you, when you, did he doodle when he talked and whatever you remember, could you share with me? I, I so don't... I've been asked to re repeat the questions coming from the audience mm -hmm. just for the Zoom audience. So the question is about, um, the professor, professor Shalcross has seen many manuscripts with doodles on them and she uh, has this, uh, understanding that he was just constantly doodling. And so I'm sorry, I'm going to shorten it a bit to start of the question was, has Cynthia Haven in her work in manuscripts or actually in her encounters with Neil seen him doodling? Does she have any insight um, into this practice, which Bojena said, you know, that you can call, uh, you can call them doodles, you can all, also call them drawings. He was uh, very, yeah, yeah drawing. draw writings, yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't see them, <laughs> but I'd be interested in it, and I'll be interested to see what you write about them. And he certainly didn't doodle when I was around him, so. Yeah, well, it's very curious what Dana said, because according to the archives, he stopped doodling at some point, uh, and um, there is no continuation 
uh, in his, uh, you know, in his later uh, manuscripts of, of that manner of this habit of doodling. And, and but Danner said that it's not true that the poet uh, was a, uh, you know, a dedicated uh, doodle. <laughs> 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 to, anyway, the, to the end. So, so. <laughs> But not apparently not on his manuscripts. I mean, he started to, you know, uh, to, to type, uh, and uh, there are less handwritten manuscripts. At least that's the you know the image that I had, the perception that I had uh, when I was there last time. Uh, there, meaning at the Beinek Library. Um, and I, the next yeah. question, if you don't mind. Uh, is about California. California that is, of course, uh, subject to the parallax view, but also it is the place where he, um, because of the, of the uh, richness and beauty of nature, of the nature in California, where he has those um, epiphanies, when he has moments of pure happiness. Yes. And um, I, I would like to hear whether you could comment. It is so rare that an old man or older man um, retains the capacity to, to experience something that is so unwarranted, like an epiphany. I think So let me, okay. yeah, okay. So, I said the- So the audience has said they can unzoom their screen and hear the question. Okay, okay, thank you, Esther. I think that that's, one of the most underrated or underobserved aspect of them is in a time when we're living longer and longer. He is a terrific poet of old age, of guiding us through those that you know passageway and not just seeing darkness as he did, but also seeing illumination. Some of those poets' poems towards the end, and even a couple of prose poems, are just astonishing. Um, California overwhelmed him, and its beauty overwhelmed him, and its barrenness overwhelmed him, and it's a big state, and there are the barren bits, and there's the deserts, and then there are the small the towns, and there's the coast, and um, there's earthquakes, and there's the increasingly wild fight. Um, I think to be confronted with that scale is to that drastic rain in the scale is to um, open oneself up to the miraculous and the unknown. Mm -hmm. I mean, I call Grizzly Peak his Patmos. <laughs> and if you, if you go to that place, it's just um, to imagine having that view every day of his life in Berkeley. That changes you. <laughs> Angelina. Um, thank you very much for, for the reading. It was a, a very, very uh, enjoyable and, and fascinating. Um, I'm interested in what you were mentioning about hybridity. Um, so on the one hand, you spoke about uh, him always have inhabiting different perspectives and different points of view and having four dimensions uh, in his vision. Um, and it, at some point, the uh, achieving hybridity, and I'm wondering how you think of that. I understand that the the two sisters in the in the Arizona desert is the image encapsulating that, but I'm wondering if you can speak more about about that. Is um, how does it relate to this four dimensionality that you spoke about earlier? Um, what does it mean to be uh, to have that hybrid consciousness or or to be a hybrid? Uh, does the four dimensionality recede to the points become closer? What is that? I, I, How does it look? I didn't mean to get into physics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just, um, as I see, I can see it in relation to the 60s. He saw, you know, he could sympathize with the students protesting. He could also, Berkeley had saved him. Um, you were talking about the Beinecke archives. Uh, one of the letters, two of the letters I, I found and I 
mention in the book were two letters from to Henry Kissinger. And one of them is in the 19, I don't remember, early 60s or something like that. No, not that early 60s, he would have been in birthday then in the, in the 1950s when he is begging for work. It's, it makes you cringe, his humiliation. He, Kissinger was a young professor and was in charge of some um, project or something like that. And he's groveling for money. And then another letter in the 1980s where he is congratulating Henry Kissinger on his elevation. And it's right after the Helsinki Accords. And it's a very nuanced letter about uh, resorting to what Metternich had done <laughs> in Europe and the, the change in him. And you know both those perspectives of the same man at a different point in his life, um, he could retain so many points of view at once. Uh, and yet he strongly expressed himself at one. I, I didn't mean to make it. Yes, I think there is a sort of melding of different perspectives in different worlds. Um, that could be the subject of a whole dissertation in itself. But basically, I just think that he had the ability to see the opposite. So not his identity that is somehow hybridized, that is absorbing uh, I think it is. Um, I just, I can't say four dimensional or, or anything like that. Obviously, he's incorporating all of those and weaving into his poetry. These, all these poems that have these contradictory images and these different times, different places, different sensibilities, different points of view all at once. Any questions? Uh, anybody on Zoom want to pose a question? Just invite Anne. Could you talk a little bit, a bit about the relationship between his poetry writing and his his teaching at Berkeley and what that looked like and how he conceptualized teaching as opposed to writing poetry? Were they two different spheres of his life? I think so. I mean, I don't see, uh, I heard different versions of his teachings, teaching, um, some describing him as a very, obviously he opened worlds, but you know, someone else said that he was kind of very formal. Uh, another one expressed him dancing around the room to illustrate with Spiansky's The Wedding. <laughs> so, um, I think his students could, could, would you know were changed by him but I don't know how much of that happened after class the ones that he took in versus I mean obviously he changed Richard Lurie in that moment where his uh, paper was read out loud <laughs> Richard Lurie is the one who who is uh, apparently deprived of historical awareness and, and actually in one of his last works is, is a, a book on Stalin. So <laughs> he probably took, uh, well, he washes his uh, comment very soon. Yes, he, he came to see, he came to realize that what Miwosh was, was talking about was not something good that you would necessarily want to acquire. Something was painful and a kind of internal scarring. And I have no doubt that Lori uh, learned about that over the years himself. But, you know, it's the sort of thing that wounds you into being. <laughs> that kind of criticism from somebody that wise, that, that old in his heart and head. Um, yeah, but it's also true. And, and I know of those instances when, when Miwash um, felt that there was such a gap between him and uh, very young people. Uh, there was... Uh, one uh, American student, doctoral student, uh, interested in his work, who visited him, wanted to talk about uh, wartime, his wartime poetry. And, and Miwash uh, was puzzled 
by by this situation and he said how can you understand what was going on then and there meaning uh, in, 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 in Poland uh, I mean Poland didn't exist obviously in the uh, occupied by by the Nazis country and she was offended um, she was offended that he uh, somehow denied her the capacity to imagine the past so well, you know you see it all the time though I mean I, I see it with Americans people having very harsh judgments of the Poles who took bribes or whatever and it's just like you have no idea what you do if your life is a life of your family depended on a betrayal of someone else you know these impossible moral when you live through them they change you no matter what you choose you know we all applaud the heroes but there aren't any many heroes that's why they are <laughs> that's why things roll the way they do i don't know how i behave one likes to think that one would be virtuous and do the right thing i know too much about myself to believe that i'm that person always uh, so i think that's what he saw i mean it's just um he didn't see that much probably he saw the um opening of the of the ghetto its liquidation he probably saw the uprising uh because he well he did because mm -hmm. because he wrote about this um a poem that was actually in itself an act of courage a poem written in warsaw during the war um, and a poem that addresses the uh, annihilation of the Jewish nation. I mean, we don't have many um, witnesses like this. The poem is, of course, a masterpiece on top of everything else. So since he was in the center, in the heart of this, of this uh, incredibly um, tragic time, he probably didn't know how to communicate it to. No, how could you? How, how could you communicate with that? And that was the gap. You can't communicate with that. You can't communicate that in your teaching necessarily. You can tell people, like that quote I like about we discovered rediscovered good and evil, something clear like the taste of bread. How can you describe that to someone who never had bread? I mean, how do you how do you communicate with that? Um, but you communicate that with your being. I mean, people could see that there was something different about him. It wasn't hard to observe, but it's not something that you can take in as a stitch in time saves nine or something like that. I mean, it's something you have to live. And he did an awful lot of living, even for 93 years. It's amazing. It's like three or four lifetimes in one, one, um, in one life. I mean, that's something I've been saying a couple times uh, recently is um, Peter Dale Scott's got a book coming out on me, well, I hope in the next year. And um, of course, Clara Cavanaugh is working. It's just like, there's such a non-competitiveness I find among me, scholars, because 20 people can write a book about me, and there's no overlap. <laughs> he was so enormous. He was such a universe. It was the continent Nimosh. A, a very hard worker, a very multifaceted. I mean, that's even that's too trivial a word for him, really, isn't it? It's it's, um, it's uh, that that you can you can continue to dissect and read and learn from him for your whole life. I've been doing it for 20 years now. <laughs> that's what uh, Anthony Nimosh actually says that. His father was constantly uh, doing things, constantly working, getting up in the morning and working, working throughout the day. Yeah. Quietly. I remember as a student uh, standing on the quad with David Frick, who was a faculty member in the Slavic department then, and, and him telling me about Milos has passed and it seemed that he just wanted to be sure, you know, that I understood um, what the Milos had been through and that, you know, I respected that. Um, so it wasn't, but, yeah, but it wasn't just the war. I mean, like the yeah. groveling poverty, 
we were talking about the alienation of various, you know, everybody hated him in the 1950s. <laughs> I mean, when he, you know, when he defected, all the French turned against him because the intelligentsia of France was Stalinist. They were against him. The Americans were against him coming to America because uh, they thought he was a communist. Um, and he was poor and writing groveling letters to Henry Kissinger, who was a young professor. I mean, it's just, um, there was no joy anywhere. He was drunk and near suicidal off. And I understand in Paris, it is just, um, suffering was endless. And uh, it wasn't just, I mean, it, it's, it's reductive the way we kind of drop to one knee when we talk about him and say, oh, poet of witness. Yes, he was, but he was also so much more than that. And the suffering went on for years. I mean, I think for Andrei Fonacek's biography has brought out how much suffering there was in his home. I mean, like, you see, he couldn't even talk about it because in those, in those days, especially, there was no language for that. The madness of one of his sons, the slow debilitating illness of his wife. It doesn't get the grand publicity that being a poet witness does, but my goodness. I mean, <laughs> It's, uh, but as he said in the Nobel thing, the only thing that you can do is turn to translating the Psalms of David, which he did. But he also said that to survive, and America one had to have the strength of the horse. It was, you know, it was so difficult. And uh, this uh, teaching position that he had didn't make his life easier. Certainly there was, and he, 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 he had to teach um, instead of, you know, writing his poetry, he had to make ends meet. He had a steady job, a tenured yeah. position, which he got good. it at unheard of speed apparently. And that was uh, doing the department, they, they made sure that tenure to have a permanent job and not have to be worrying about. I'm not sure that they realized what they, Gift after no, they didn't. <laughs> I was I was thinking about that. You know that when he was hired at Berkeley a couple of years later, they hired um, someone here at University of Chicago, also a writer, Maria Kunsevich, um, but she did not have the same impact. And I don't know if they had any idea the sort of impact that that English would have. I mean, I think it's to Frank Whitfield's credit that he. Yes. He, yeah, he, he had the courage to, to, you know, to try to pull this off and really pursued it as he did. And he was a very unlikely champion, he, as, yeah. I, as I said right now in the he book. He used to wear, I was telling my wife this morning, he used to wear a bow tie and he taught uh, old, old Slavonic and... Did a dictionary of some sort of a yeah, lexicon. Yes. Um, so again, maybe, uh, you know, two, two different natures, but they saw something, as he certainly saw something. And Mivos was given great freedom to do things like go to Paris and transcribe. But he was yeah. maybe maybe we maybe we could sure. add one element to this yeah. uh, portrait. Uh, he was a very good friend and very generous friend uh, to his fellow poets. I mean, yes. Look what he did to Vat Alexander Vat. I mean, the book of conversations is. It's remarkable. Yeah. That's it. And he could do that because he had great freedom in Berkeley to, you know, to take the time to do the transcriptions and the interviews. Richard Lurie was translating them eventually. But like, um, yeah, that's an amazing thing. Yeah. Alexander Vaught, by the way, said that Berkeley was worse than the, worse than the Lubyanka. <laughs> yeah, well, he was a very <laughs> peculiar person. <laughs> I know, I just, uh, the exaggeration of that comparison. <laughs> it was said in the moment of uh, <laughs> distress. Well, I like what Miłosz said. Um, the difference between Poland and America, and, uh, somebody correct is in Poland, intellectual activity is the subject of cafe conversations and feuds and all of that. And 
you know, when Bob was here, as Mimo said, he didn't quite get, you know, that if you wanted to write a paper, write it. Don't want to, don't. <laughs> you want to give a speech, give a speech. If you don't, don't. And nobody cares. You like doing it in the vacuum. There was no conversations, no meetings, no newspaper columns, no discussions in the cafes. That's kind of like being in the moon with no gravity. Um, that, that, that aspect of things was just, you know, puzzling to the Europeans. Okay. I'm getting the signal that it is time. So let us, uh, were there any last questions what, or comments? From well, the there's one last question from Nevin Karlovac, which might be a one to end on, I suppose. Uh, he just asked if there were any comments on the roadside dog, which uh, he finds absolutely captivating. <laughs> well, I'm told to piece it to the road. I'm told that that was a product of a dry spell, that he was kind of exhausted. He didn't have, he didn't have anything he wanted to write. So instead of doing nothing, he invented this little form of these short sketches. So it was like if he couldn't make a monument, he would make a good, nice little statue or something until he could, until more poems came or whatever else he, was his major effort. It is delightful, isn't it? But he also says that the the um, presence of the roadside dog is somehow Polish, more Polish than, you know, I don't know, American, that you can see quite a few uh, feral dogs or, you know, homeless dogs uh, along the roads in America. Well, we do have coyotes. <laughs> <laughs> do we have coyotes. Are you saying that they eat those dogs? No. no they do. Facetious. They do. Yeah. Okay, on that note, uh, we, will, we will wrap things up here. Um, we've learned that uh, Cynthia is not just a wonderful writer, but also a wonderful conversationalist. And thank you very much. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. It's been a pleasure.